You do. Okay. All right. There you go. All right, Gabe. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It's a pleasure to be here. And after that introduction, I'll have to try to live up to the expectations. But <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's great to be here. So today I'd like to spend the next uh, maybe three quarters of an hour or so uh, chatting with you about the gravitational wave astronomy and how uh, in the last few years we have invented and found a new way to study our universe. So last, I'd like to say that we are now listening to the dark side of the universe. And you'll see why. I say that. So since, you know, millennia ago, humans have always been interested in understanding the universe. And it's, 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 to, it's to be expected, right? You look up at the, the night sky, you see so many stars, and you wonder what's going on there and uh, what, 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 is, what are all those things out there? Over the years and the centuries, we learned so many other ways to study our universe. And we learned how to look up at what happens out there, look at, look at stars using not only the light that we could see with our own eyes, but all different kinds of colors of light. And so by ad other colors, I mean other um, parts of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. So different kinds of lights that give us a different picture of the universe. And you see in all those images you see here, every one of those rectangles is an image, a photo of the same part of the, of the sky, our night sky. The very first one is what you see if you are out in the desert in a very dark sky and you look up and you see the Milky Way and all the stars. But then we learn how to look at what happens, for example, when there is hydrogen, which is hot, and there's a lot of hydrogen there. Look at this red photo here, how different it, you can imagine how much more information there is when you change your ability to look at the universe with a different kind of light, different kind of electromagnetic radiation. And then as the years went on, we learned to use gamma rays and microwaves, even go back to, to the uh, look at what happens right before the, the initial explosion that originated the universe, right after the Big Bang. And this picture here shows you the very first light that was, if you want, produced in the universe and that traveled all the way to us. So all of these images of our universe, each one of them give us a very different kind of information on what's, how our universe, how nature works. But they're all, every single one of them, they're all obtained using electromagnetic waves. So a different kind of light. I'm not, talk, I'm not gonna talk at all about light of electromagnetic waves tonight, because I want to tell you that we finally managed to find a new way to study our universe using completely different kind of waves of radiation, which is what we call gravitational waves. And so today, when I want to try to tell you what we have learned and what is out there when we look at the universe with gravitational waves. Before I do that, I think I should explain what gravitational waves are. So you might have guessed by now that I was not born here in the United States. I'm Italian, so sometimes English is a kind of a baffling language to me. And so well, when I was not able to understand a word, I would just pick up a dictionary and look it, look it up. So I try to do that for fun, for gravitational waves. And you actually find the definition, but if you read it, I'm not gonna read it because it's just not that you know, uh, useful. You don't understand much more. So what can we do to try to understand what, what the gravitational waves are? Well, we have two words here, right? Gravity and waves. So let's try to understand each one of them and then we put them together. Well, the simplest one to start is waves. We are all familiar with waves. For a physicist like me, a wave is some sort of periodic oscillation. So something that goes up and down, back and forth, that goes, you know, an oscillation over time that can propagate and travel through matter or through space. And for example, right now I'm, I'm speaking, so I'm producing sound waves. And sound are pressure waves in air. These sounds travel to my computer and then it, the sound get converted into electric waves that travel to wires and then through radio and they get to you, to your computer. So we are even right now using to talk to each other a lot of different kinds of waves. 
But even if you look out of nature, you have ocean waves, even earthquakes, they are kind of wave vibration, perturbation that travel to you through rock, through earth. And of course, light and radio, as I mentioned earlier, there are some kind of uh, um, electromagnetic waves. So there's a key point here that's interesting for about waves that they can interfere in constructive and destructive way. What does that mean? Well, if you look at this animation in the white rectangle here, you see two waves that are traveling at different, one is still and the other one is traveling. So you can imagine that you can have two waves that travel together. If the two waves goes up and down at the same time altogether, then they will sum up and reinforce each other. And what you get is a bigger wave. But if they're going up and down at opposite times, so doing something like this, then when you sum them up, when one is high, the other is low. And when the first one is low, the other is high. So when you sum them up, they cancel out and you don't get anything. So this is what we call destructive interference. So it happens that when the two waves are perfectly oscillating in a position, you don't get anything. But then if one is a little bit later, the others are a little bit earlier, then you can still get a little bit of uh, oscillation going on, a little bit of wave traveling on. So this is all we need to know about waves today. Well, let's move on to gravity. Well, the history of how we understand gravity goes back a long, long time ago. The first person that tried to explain gravity was Aristotle, many, more than 2000 years ago. And he just got the basic idea right that heavy stuff fall down and light stuff don't fall down, which is a smart observation, but not much in terms of understanding what's going on. The first one that actually started making some progress was Galileo Galilei. Of course, I'm Italian, I have to put Galileo in some, all of my talks, right? But Galileo was key because he understood that the right way to describe uh, nature is, by, is using mathematics. And also he understood that one has to try to do some experiment, build a theory. A theory is an idea of how things work and they test this idea out and see if it works. And so he would, he found out that uh, all objects, even if they have different weights, even if they're made of different stuff, they fall with the same acceleration. And that's very interesting. We have to get to Isaac Newton to have the very first full complete explanation of how gravity works. And you, I think you're all familiar with the um, uh, law of attraction by Newton telling us how objects uh, are, um, are attracting each other because of gravity. And Newton's theory is great because it's good enough to explain almost everything that goes on on Earth, even the solar system, how the planets goes, they, how they go around the, the sun, all these things. It explained almost everything. There were a little few things here and there that were not quite clear. So we have to get to uh, this guy called Albert Einstein. I'm sure you, you've heard this name a couple of times in your life. And a little bit more than 100 years ago, uh, Einstein explained the best, in the best way we know today is how gravity works. And his explanation of gravity, what we call the general, the theory of general relativity, is telling us that gravity is a property of space and time. This means that when you have a big object like Earth, this will deform space around itself. And objects like the moon that would like to move in a straight line in, in the universe, actually they see the fabric of space and time bent, curved. And so it, what it happens is exactly what would happen if you had a big sheet of rubber and you put a big ball in the center, you create sort of a, you know, a, a hole. And then if you throw a marble on this thing, it's not going to go in a straight line, but it's going to go around, around, around because the uh, rubber is bent by the presence of this object in the center. The same exact things happens when you have a big object like the sun or earth that sits somewhere and that creates a deformation of space. And then things that are moving around, they go in an orbit like the, the moon moves in a circle around earth because the moon thinks it's going on a straight line, but a straight line is actually this circular orbit because the space itself is bent. Well, at this point, we are ready to put together waves and gravity. So if one object creates a deformation of space and time, then imagine you have two big objects, like two stars that are orbiting one around each other, like it is animation. So each one would create its own deformation of space and time. 
But since they're moving, this deformation is changing over time. And so what happens is that those two objects are moving one around the other, they create ripples in space and time. And those ripples are what we call gravitational waves. And they travel out in the universe at the speed of light. And so what we have tried and what we finally managed to do is to detect those ripples after they travel for a long, long distance and they go to Earth. And so we can see how those ripple, how those gravitational waves behave here. And from the shape of those waves, we can understand what happened when the two stars were moving one around each other. If you want, it's like when you have a drop of water falling in a pond, where you toss a stone in a pond, there's a lot of stuff going on where the drop or where the stone hit the water. But then if you're far away, you only see the small ripples on the surface that are, that are what, what is let, left over of this big explosion in the center after you know, those waves propagate away. And you can imagine that if you're smart enough and you look at the shape of those waves, you can actually understand and predict and know what happened at the center when the two, when the two stars collided or when this stone fall into the pond. So that's the idea we, we, what we did. So looking at gravitational waves right here and try to understand what happens at their source. So I've said a couple of times now that gravitational waves deform space and time. What does that mean? Well, let's imagine we make this, you know, this uh, experiment and we have out in space, there's nothing else. We are far from any object, far from the sun, far from earth. And we have a ring of masses, a ring of objects that are perfectly still like that. What happens if a big gravitational wave is coming right through your screen is that those, the distance between those objects start to oscillate. Well, it's oscillating because it's a wave, so that's not a surprise. The special property of a gravitational wave is this differential nature. The fact that when one direction is stretched, the other direction is squeezed. And when the first direction is squeezed, the other is stretched. So this is the kind of effect that would happen. So this is a huge gravitational wave. The effect is way, way smaller. But when a gravitational wave crosses Earth, and this happens continuously all the time, everything, including me, you, and the table, the computer, the screen, everything is stretched and squeezed in this way. Don't be worried. It's not this big, of course. Otherwise, it would be easier to detect gravitational waves. The point is that the effect is really, really small. How small? Well, if this is a, a, a representation of the hydrogen atom, you see the electron going around like crazy in the nucleus, we have to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. This is the a proton, so the nucleus the at, of the atom. And then we zoom in, and this small change here is just about how much the effect in changing the distance is due to a gravitational waves happen over a distance of a couple of miles. So if we were able to monitor the distance between objects that are two miles away, this is how much does that distance would change because of the passage of gravitational waves. This is an incredibly small amount. It's, it's the equivalent of being able to measure a change in the distance from here to Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star, with an accuracy which is about the size of a human hair, the thickness of a human hair. So this is a very, very, very precise measurement. So maybe some of you now want to stop me and say, okay, this is hopeless. This is all science fiction. You can't possibly do anything like that. Well, we did it. We managed to build instruments that are sensitive enough to detect these small changes in distances. How did we do that? Well, I'm mostly an experimentalist. So I work to build and improve those instruments. So I like to spend a little bit of time to explain to you how they actually work. The basic idea is what we call the Michelson interferometer. It's a complicated word, but the idea here is we have a laser source that you see here. And this laser source creates a laser beam. A laser beam is nothing else than a wave, a wave of light. Then we have that mirror there that splits the wave in two equal beams. Those beams will travel four kilometers, two and a half miles in one direction, and two and a half miles, four kilometers in the other direction. They will recombine back at the beam splitter, and then if we tune the two lengths so that the time of travel is exactly the same, then the two waves coming back, they will 
cancel each other because if, if you remember what I said at the beginning, one will go up while the other goes down. And so we have destructive interference. But then remember what happens when a gravitational wave comes by. It's gonna change the distances, but change the distances in a particular way. One of the two arms of the interferometer will get longer while the other gets shorter. So one of the two beams will have to travel a little bit more and then it will come back later than the other one. So if the two waves were, for, were canceling each other at the beginning, they cancel each other anymore. And so we see some light there. So here's the basic idea. This is an instrument that can take gravitational waves, that can take the change in distance due to gravitational waves and convert into a, a very, very small change of light. But then we can put a detector there and see that change in light. So this is the basic idea. The real thing is more complex than that. So this is a flyover of one of our two detector, which is in Washington state. So that building in the center is where the laser is and where the um, mirror that split the laser in two is. This is another detector we have in Louisiana. So you can see that there are two concrete tubes that go in two uh, perpendicular directions. Now we're back here in, in the, the one in Washington state. This is an animation what would happen if you went with the laser beam inside actually the, the vacuum tube. So what happens here that we have those big interferometer, which is made four kilometers long, two and a half miles long. And we have some mirrors at the end, the laser bounces back and we are continuously monitoring the change of distance between those mirrors. So those are big instruments, two and a half miles by two and a half miles. That's why we had to build them out where there's a lot of space so in Washington state in the middle of the desert or in Louisiana in where there's also a lot of, uh, of land that can be used. And you might ask, why do we have two of them? And the reason is that having two of them so much, uh, so far apart means that when the gravita gravitational wave is coming by, it might just hit one detector a little bit earlier than the other one. And then what we can do when we analyze our data is, is do what we call a triangulation. So we can measure the time difference when the, the wave hits one detector, when it hits the other detector, and use that to understand in which direction thing that this signal is coming in the sky. And this is exactly what our brain does with our ears. You know, you can close your eyes and listen to my voice. And even, even though you cannot see me or you cannot see the, uh, your computer, you can still guess from which direction my voice is coming. Because if it's coming from one side, it comes from the other side, my the, way the, the sound wave generated by my voice will hit one ear a little bit earlier than the other one. And then our brain does this triangulation and then we can tell from which direction the voice is coming. And we do exactly the same thing with our detectors. That's why we have two and three, which is because there's one more in, in Italy, in, in Europe. So by using multiple detectors, we can actually tell from which direction in the sky the signal is coming. As you can imagine, I mean, making this instrument big is one key step to reach the sensitivity we need, but that's not quite enough. There's a lot of very high level technology that goes into all of this. All our systems need to be in vacuum, so without air, because otherwise all the vibration in the air due to sounds and voices and noise will create an effect which is way bigger than what we actually want to detect for, with gravitational waves. Our mirrors that you see here are big pieces of the most pure glass you can imagine that we can, we can build. And then those mirrors cannot just sit on ground. Otherwise, the vibration of the ground due to traffic or due to small earthquake will again be so much bigger than the waves we have to detect. And so they are all isolated from vibration with suspension system, which you, you see depicted here that are quite complex. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of engineering, a lot of, 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 of uh, design and a lot of cleverness going into these detectors. It, it, you can imagine it took a long time to build them and to make them, them work. But finally, we managed to have them work and we started detecting gravitational waves. So now I would like to spend the rest of my, of my chat to tell you a little bit of what we saw and what we learned. So the Story, I'd like to start the story with the very first detection, which is kind of old news now because it was, you know, uh, in 2015, so it feels like a long time ago. But this is still important because at that time, that was the very first time we detected gravitational waves. So it was a key point to just show that we are able to, uh, to do it. So what happened is that uh, 
a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, this is not, this is not a citation, just I made this sentence up on the spot, that two black holes were orbit orbiting one around each other. And by orbiting one around each other, they were deforming space and time. And the more they deform space and time, the more gravitational waves they emitted. But by emitting gravitational waves, they were losing energy and so falling one to each other and falling faster and faster one to each other and, until the point they collided and they created one single black hole that then was there, still there in the middle of nowhere. What I'm showing here, was, it's not a real image, it's just a simulation of how it would have looked if you were close enough. And this is another way you look at it. You see those two black things of the two black holes, and you can see those shades of green. This is a way to represent how much space and time was deformed. What you, want, you, you should see here is that as, I mean, when the two black holes get closer and closer and closer, they move faster, but they also deforming space more and more. You see that the green gets brighter and brighter and brighter. So the waves are moving out faster, but they're also getting brighter. So this is the signature of two objects falling into each other. The more they fall, they get closer, the faster they have to move, and the more intense the gravitational wave is. It's what we call the chirp. But at this point, maybe I should just go a step back and explain briefly what black holes are, because maybe not everybody knows what a black hole here is. And so to explain what a black hole is, we have to make a sort of a mind experiment. So you have all played with stones and throwing stones, and you know that the faster you throw a stone, the farther away it goes. And so you can imagine that if you have a stone in your hand or a cannon sh uh, shooting a ball, then if you shoot it fast, faster and faster and faster, you're gonna go farther, farther and farther. But since earth is round, at some point you can shoot it far enough that it's never gonna fall down. It's gonna go into an orbit. To go one step farther than that, you can imagine you can shoot this thing right, to, right up. So if you shoot the, if you can shoot your, your ball not too, too fast, the ball will go up and then fall down. The faster you shoot it up and the farther away it's gonna go. There is what is called an escape velocity. So a velocity on Earth that if you shoot anything up faster than that, it's going to escape the gravitational pull of Earth faster than Earth can actually slow it down. So it's never gonna fall back again. So this is what we call the escape velocity. And you can imagine that this depends on two main things, how much mass there is, the more mass you have and the stronger the gravitational pull is. And so the gravitational pull of Earth is uh, uh, smaller than the gravitational pull of the sun, for example, because the sun is bigger. But you can also take the same amount of stuff, the same amount of mass, and make it smaller. And if you compress the same amount of, of matter, mass, onto a smaller object, then you have the same amount of mass, but closer. And so the pull of gravity is also stronger. And so the more mass you have, or the smaller the object is, and the more speed you need to be able to escape this object. And so you can imagine you can take Earth and make it smaller, and make it smaller, and make it smaller. And so the smaller you make it, and the faster you have to shoot your cannonball up to make it escape. But there's a catch here. There is a universal speed limit. Nothing in the universe can go faster than the speed of light, which is about 300,000 kilometers per second, or about 186,000 miles per second. It's fast, it's very fast, but still, you can imagine to take Earth and make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and the escape velocity will get bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, it will get so big that the object to escape would need to go faster than the speed of light, but that is not possible. So nothing can escape from that object at that point. What you get is a black hole. So how much do we have to compress Earth to do that? Well, from Earth, you, you will need to take all the mass of Earth and make it pretty much this big, nine millimeter, I don't know, that's like half an inch or something like that. So that's not realistic. If you take the, the sun, you will have to compress it down to three kilometers, you know, a couple of miles, which might seem unrealistic, but this can actually happen. So when the sun is sitting there because it's an equilibrium between the pressure of nuclear explosion, nuclear radiation, keeping it, you know, pushing it up and gravity pulling it down. But when the sun will finish, or when a star finishes the nuclear fuel in the, in, the, in the nucleus, 
and there's nothing that can fight gravity anymore. And so stars actually collapse and create a black hole. Well, you might have seen this picture some a couple of years ago. This was the very first picture of a very big black hole in a galaxy far away, so M87. So this black circle you see here is what we call the event horizon. It's that distance from the center black hole where stuff would need to move faster than the speed of light to be able to escape. And so we, we see it black because nothing, not even light can come out of that. So this, is, this was the first image of actually how black hole would look like. So this was, I think, a pretty remarkable picture. But now let's explain what black holes are. Let's go back to our first discovery of gravitational waves. So what you see here is one way to represent the signal we saw from the collision of the two black holes. And uh, you can recognize two of the things that I, I was telling you earlier. So first, it's a wave, so it's oscillating up and down. And then you see that as time goes by, the peak amplitude, the, how big those ripples are, those waves are, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the reason that happens is exactly because uh, the two objects get closer and so they deform space more and more. And you can also see that the peak of the oscillations, they get closer and closer in time, as, which is again, one way to say that the two objects were moving faster and faster and faster. And so this is an example of how gravitational wave signal look like. And this was the very first time we ever detected gravitational waves on earth and we ever detected two black holes colliding. If you want, this was also the first ever proof that black holes were actually behaving as we expect, and that two black holes could exist one around each other and collide. So this is where everything started. This is where gravitational wave astronomy really began in 2015. There's one other thing, maybe even more exciting than that, that, that happened a couple of years later. Well, it is, this is really where I would I like to say that a new kind of astronomy was born because at that point we saw something that looked really different because we didn't see two black holes colliding, but we saw two neutron star collidings. But before I explain the details all of that, I want you to listen to the sound that we reconstructed from the gravitational waves that we measure of the two neutron stars colliding. So here I just wanna make clear that gravitational waves are not sound but they are vibration in space and time. But it so happened that we can take them and convert into sound. So what you're gonna listen is actually the sound of the gravitational waves of two neutron stars colliding. So this noise here is just a background noise of our detector. It's like being a noise If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a faint line appearing here as you move on. And this is where the signal of the two neutron stars is happening. It's a little hard to hear, but if you get to the near the end, you can listen it. So if you listen carefully, you heard the near the end, something that went like whoop, which is what we call the chirp. But that's, it's not something we made up. This is actually the signals we collect with our detector and it's gravitational waves from those two neutron stars colliding converted into sound. And uh, you can imagine that from this, with our analysis procedure, we can get a lot of information about what's going on. And what was going on were again, two neutron stars that they're not black holes. They're kind of old stars, I'll get to there in a moment. And they were orbiting around each other and getting closer and closer and closer. And since they're star, they get the form, it's all messy there. And when they collided, it's like two big nuclei or two atoms just colliding. They create a huge explosion. And so detecting this kind of signal and seeing that they are two neutron stars told us that we were, we were expecting to see out there a big explosion, some, some light coming from, from that collision. And that was one of the exciting things. But before we get to that, what is a neutron star? Well, I hinted at this a little bit earlier. So when I, when I told you that stars are the big balls of hot gas, basically, 
and they're in equilibrium, they don't collapse and don't explode because there's a balance of gravity that wants to pull them together and make them smaller and smaller. And the heat and the pressure from the nuclear reaction in the center of the star that balance that out by pushing it out. But then when the nuclear reaction are over, there's no any fuel, fuel anymore, then the star collapse and the core of the star collapses faster than the outer star, than the outer part. And then what happens if the star is big enough that all the gas in the outside part of the star bounces off the center of the star in a big explosion, that's what is created a supernova. And what remains after that explosion depends on how big the star is. If the star is a little bit bigger than the size of our sun, but no more than something around three times the size of a star, then gravity can pull it together and squeeze everything so much that the electrons in every atom will fall into the nucleus. They will merge with protons. And you know that the atoms is made of neutrons, protons, and electrons. You can get all the electrons squeezed into the protons and you have a big ball of neutrons. And this is what we call, with a lot of fantasy, of course, a neutron star. And this, is happen if, this is what happens when the star is big, but not super big. If the star is even bigger, more than three times the sun, the times of the, sun, the, the mass of the sun, then not even the repulsion between neutron and neutron is enough. And so gravity wins and everything collapses into a black hole. So what we, we saw is actually the collision of what is the remnant of two stars that were at the end of their life. You might ask me, how big are those neutron stars? Because if you remember earlier, we said that we have to, make, to turn the sun into a black hole, we have to squeeze it down to a few kilometers, a few miles. So it sounds a very, very small thing. Neutron stars aren't quite that small, but they're still pretty small. So this is the size of a typical neutron star, which would have a mass of about one and a half times the mass of our sun, compared with the skyline of Chicago. So they're something like 10 miles in diameter. So think of all the mass of the sun, a little bit more than that, everything squeezed down in a big ball that is about you know, 10 miles or something like that. So these things is extremely heavy. So one cubic inch of these things would weight like Mount Everest or something like that. So this is very weird stuff, very heavy stuff. Nevertheless, we saw, we, we, we see a lot of them out there and we saw two of them colliding. And what was even more exciting is that uh, we didn't only detect the gravitational wave from the collision, but we, we also detect, uh, and this is kind of a chime that has nothing to do with the real thing, but you see this big peak, this small peak here. It's what a satellite, which is called Fermi, which is a satellite orbiting Earth and looking at the sky in gamma radiation. The Fermi detected a small blip there, but that's what we call a gamma ray burst. And that's exactly what got to Earth of that big explosion that I told you happened when the two stars collided. And so this was, if you want, the very first time that we have something detected with gravitational waves and immediately after something detected with electromagnetic waves, so some kind of light. So this was really important because putting all this information together, we could just pinpoint in the sky where we believe this object, this collision happened. And then at that point, maybe a third of all the astronomers in the world were running to point their telescopes there to be the first to detect actually what happened. And the SWOP telescope was the first one that 10 hours after the collision detected a new little thing there. So this big black dot here is a galaxy far, far away. And this new dot wasn't there in a, in a picture of the same galaxy that they took some 20 days before. So that was a new star, not really a new star, but the aftermath of this big explosion. If you want a few, uh, a little bit later, the Hubble Space Telescope actually took a better picture of that image. So now you can recognize this as a galaxy and you can see these yellow things there in the square is this new object that is, what remains after the collision and the big explosion that happened after the two stars. In the box here, you can see that as time passes by, this thing is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And that's not surprising, right? You have the two stars colliding, they create a big mess, a lot of superheated gas 
and a lot of energy that is dissipated away and gone out in forms of gamma rays and radio waves and radiation of every kind. So these things cools down. And so it was actually quite remarkable to be able to see first the gravitational wave that tell us exactly when the explosion happened, to see the gamma ray burst, the gamma rays coming through, and then being able to follow, follow up and see that the cloud of gas around this thing was cooling down and emitting less and less light. It was exciting also because by looking at how that light was, so what were the different colors in that light, different components of that light, astronomers were able to actually detect what kind of chemical elements were there. Because you, you've seen, for example, if you look out, if you go out uh, at night and you look at the street lamps, some are yellow, some are blue, they have different colors, right? And the, the reason even street lamps have different colors is because there are different gases and different kind of elements that are heated up. So every chemical element, when it's heated up, produce light at a slightly different color. And so by looking at the color of the light coming from this explosion, we could actually tell what elements were generated in the big explosion. And this was a very important thing because we proved a theory that we had for a long time that a lot of the heavy elements, the periodic table, so a lot of the stuff that me and you are made of are not generated, were not generated at the, at the birth of the universe. They're not generated inside stars because you can't get much heavier than iron into the star. They are actually generated when neutron star collides. So this was the first proof, if you want, that to make it a little bit more poetic, maybe that we prove that most of us, we are made of what remains in the collisions of neutron stars. So that was a pretty remarkable result, I think. And this was also the beginning of what we call multi-messenger astronomy, because we were able to observe stuff happening in the universe with so many different technologies, so many different instruments, and each one of them gave us a little bit of information. So that was 2017. What happened since then? Well, a lot happened. What I'm showing here is that uh, it's a collection of all the co different collision, the different signals of gravitational waves that we detected over the last years, up until March of 2020, when we stopped and we stopped taking data, stopped observing the universe to improve our detectors. So in this representation down here, you will see that there are always two circles there that are joined with two arrows into a bigger circle. And what happens there is that the two black holes here, they collide and they create a bigger black hole after that. So all, uh, all of these are the 90-ish uh, signals that we, we could detect. And you see that most of them are black holes. Some are very big, some are smaller, some are two neutron stars here in, uh, in, um, in orange that then create something that is probably a black hole, probably a neutron star. So you see there's a lot, a lot has, has happened. So it's been, you know, not even seven years since we detected the first signal gravitational waves and we started gravitational wave astronomy. But since then, we have detected already so many signals. And so the future of, us, of, of astronomy is really going to be this multi-messenger astronomy because we have been studying our universe with all different kinds of electromagnetic radiation, as I was saying at the beginning. And finally, now we can add one more way to study our universe, which is using gravitational waves. And already now, being able to study our universe with gravitational waves really changed our understanding. For example, nobody believed that there were so many black holes out there, and so many binary black holes. That was a surprise. But this is the fun side of science. You build an instrument to study something, to discover new things. You sure discover some of the things you were expecting. Often nature has surprises for us. And those are the best things because then you learn, you can learn a lot of new, of new things about the universe and how nature works. And so the future of astronomy, as said, is multi-messenger. And I think it's gonna be a very bright future. So right now, the LIGO detector where I work and the Virgo detector, which is one in Europe, they are shutting down, they shut down, and we are working very hard to improve the sensitivity of the detector. The plan is to be back in observation mode by the end of this year, 
with improved detectors. So if we were able to detect one gravitational wave signal every week in the previous run, we're probably gonna do twice as that, or if you're good enough, even, even better. So we're getting into the point that we're, we're, we're getting close to have a signal from gravitational waves pretty much every day of more than one per day. So this is a lot of information and a lot of new discoveries awaiting us. And with this note, I'll conclude and just leave you with these slides. If you want to know more, there's a lot of information out there. I would recommend you go to the LIGO.org website where you can find uh, some links to a lot of material, in particular, some videos that will explain all the stuff that I told you today, but way better than I was ever able to do. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, if, you, if there's still somebody awake, uh, please ask questions. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's awake. <laughs> we have, uh, do, uh, does anyone have questions? Yes, please. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if one of, of, of us are able to hear the, the beginning of time, because I think that gravitational waves is like the beginning. I hope so. So, there's two parts to your question. So gravitational waves, as I said, they're not sound. So we cannot really hear them. And uh, what, what I was, um, I was um, having you listen to is a highly amplified and processed thing you know, to, to kind of represent what was going on in gravitational waves. So to be able to actually hear gravitational waves ourselves, you would need to be very, very close to where the two objects are colliding. The second part of your question is, um, are we able to detect gravitational waves that come directly from the beginning of the universe? So you probably all know that we believe that the universe was born in a big explosion that we call the Big Bang. And uh, this, this picture that I was showing here, this, this last one, is actually the farther we can look in the past with light, electromagnetic waves of what happened in this explosion. So we know that when this explosion happened, gravitational waves were produced, they, they were created. And then they're still traveling through the universe like this background radiation in light here. We think that this background, this remnant of the big bang in gravitational waves is however, very, very weak. So the instruments we have now, they're not sensitive enough to detect them. We will need maybe 10 or 20 or 30 more years to improve our detectors to the point that maybe we will be able to detect gravitational waves coming from the Big Bang. Thank you very much. Very interesting answer. You're welcome. I, I like to leave my questions for last so I can let the students ask. Anyone else have any? Daniel? What's, the, what's your favorite, most favorite part of the job? Oh man, that's a hard question. Well, so what I like is the challenge in the sense that uh, we are doing something new every single day doesn't matter how little or how big, you know, not all days are as exciting as September 14, 2015, where we detected the first gravitational wave. And that was a very exciting day. But you know, it's what we are doing is really pushing the boundary, the limit of human knowledge. So every day you do something and when you, you get to the end of the day, you can say, I did something that nobody knew how to do before that. And so that's something that I really like. Then, of course, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of uh, days that you feel like you didn't accomplish much. But it's good to remember that you're working together with a great group, with a great, you know, with a lot of very good people with all the same goal. And the goal is to understand our universe a little bit better. Okay. Um, is there a question you have about astronomy that like um, still hasn't been answered? And if so, is there any, do you have any idea what the answer might be? Oh, well, there's, there are 
a, a lot of things we don't understand about the universe still, you know, for example, uh, I think the most exciting thing for me, because it's really related to black holes, gravitational waves, is the fact that we explain the universe by using two different uh, theories, two different languages. One is what we call quantum mechanics that explains these very small things. And the other is what we call general relativity, which, which explains how gravity works on the very big things, big mass, big stars. So the, those two languages are completely different. They can't understand each other. We do not know how to put them together. But then when you have a black hole, a black hole, you have a lot of mass, a big object, but it is also very, very small. So that's where we would need to be able to put together the quantum mechanics language to explain small things and the general relativity language to explain big things. And so we do not know how to do that. But then this means that since we are seeing black holes colliding, falling into each other, how they behave will give us some hints of how to put those two theories, those two languages together. So that for me, is one of the biggest and more most interesting questions that are still open out there that we might be able to answer hopefully soon. So, um, Gabe, Gabriel, how quickly do they dissipate and um, how far away was the, uh, I guess the farthest one you, you've you uh, detected? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So how long the signal lasts depends a lot on the objects that create them. For, for, so for, for black holes, the bigger they are and the shorter the signal is. This one, the first one we detected, there were two black holes. Each one was about 30 times the size of our sun. And you see that the amount of, you know, the, the, the duration of the, the gravitational waves you could detect was about a tenth of a second. So they're pretty fast. Other objects like the neutron stars that I was showing here, you see that I was showing you more than 30 seconds. And the reason that the neutron stars are, are, are lighter, so they, it, took long, it takes longer for them to adjust in spiral one into the other and then collide. So the duration can be between a fraction of a second to many seconds. As for how far away they were, so the very first signal we detected, the one that I was showing earlier, the two black holes collided at a distance of about uh, uh, more than one billion light years. So a light year is how far light can travel in a year. So those two black holes collided more than a billion light years away, meaning that they collided a billion years ago. And gravitational waves travel through space without feeling much of anything. And then they crossed through Earth and we were able to detect them. And that was pretty much an average distance. I believe that we saw stuff as far as 3 billion light years for binary black holes. Instead, for neutron stars, like the two that I was just showing, uh, we cannot go quite as far. We, those one were about 40 million light years, which you say, oh, only 40 million, so that's nothing. Still, you know, pretty far, pretty far away. It's way, way out of our galaxy. But that's a typical distance we can detect those kind of objects. We got a question from Corey. You probably can't see the chat. Can you see the chat? Um, uh, now I can because I opened it. Okay, <laughs> there you go. What got me interested in science and how old were you? Well, I mean, I think that if I think back when I, when I was a kid, I, as far as I can remember, I've always been interested in science. And you know, I was always curious. I remember going to the library in a small town where I grew up and trying to get all the books about science that I could read. And I especially loved the one that that uh, taught me how to build things and you know made, make small experiments. Experiments. Then you know, I think I think it's when I got to I got to high school that I started understanding better what science was. And I have to say, I was really lucky to have very good, passionate teachers, my physics teacher and my math teacher, 
they were they helped really a lot and they saw that i was interested in the topic and they helped me as much as they could and that's really what you know helped me understand okay not only liked science but was probably also good at it and so that well, when was when I decided that, that that was my career. But you know, when you start studying for real a subject and understand it's a little bit different, so I changed my direction a few times in in over the years. But I think that was a key point for me to get interested in science and decided to make it a to make it a career out of it. You're welcome. Okay, I have one, and I'm, I'm hopefully I can phrase it the right way, and because when I think about when you talked about the waves and they travel through Earth, they, um, as I see uh, something that's traveling in a wave, and I and I'm fairly certain we would have felt it if it was something that was like enormous or, or um, like that. But uh, when it when it passes through Earth. Um, is it a way that you can detect if it slows down like space and time um, it, it, as far as the earth goes? Because we, we, we're pretty much uh, stand still, right? We're just like here the entire time but the wave is traveling. So would it slow down um, time by like fractions of a second or anything like that? So yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. So the effect of gravitational wave is not only to distort space, so change the distance between objects, which is you know, what I was showing you with those uh, circle of, 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 of balls moving like that, right? So that's a very, very small effect that happens. The same that happens at the same time, it's change, it slows down and speed up time a little bit. The problem is that the effect is so small that there's no way you can detect that. So, you know, the change in distance is one part in 10 to the 18. So 0 0.0000, zeros and a one at the end, right? So very, very small. And that's the same amount a second would go faster or slower. So there's no way we can see a second that goes 0 0.00070 and a one times, you know, faster or slower. That's an effect that's there, but it's not really something that we're able to detect. Instead, with the big, this big instrument that we built, we're able to detect the, um, the, the change in the distance, which is as small, relatively speaking, but we have way more sensitive instruments to, to measure that. And so we, may, we can do that. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank so I see a question in the chat saying, why is this a new astronomy? Well, before we were able to detect the gravitational waves, we had no way to actually look, see black holes colliding because black holes are, as the name says, black. So they do not emit light of any kind. And so we didn't really know that there, was, there were that many black holes out there. We didn't even know that black holes could actually be orbiting one around each other and then collide. So gravitational waves is the only way we can see these dark side of the of the universe so thank you for the question because this brings me back to the, the explaining the title of my slide or my talk with it, which i didn't do so gravitational waves is a way to look at what happens out there for all those objects that don't produce any other kind of light of electromagnetic radiation so that's why it's a new Astronomy, it's, it's, it's imagine like you build a new instrument and you're finally able to look at the universe in a different way or with a different instrument. So you can imagine we will learn a lot with this new, this new tool we have. So as far as, um, I, I know you talk about dark holes and, and um, they mentioned that sometimes dark holes have like dark matter or energy. Do, do you um, study that as well? So yeah, the, 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 that's a very, very good question. So, and this is maybe the second most interesting open question in astronomy that we hope to be able to, uh, to answer. So right now, our understanding of the Big Bang and how the universe was generated and uh, 
how the um, how uh, it, it is stays together now. Tell us that that ninety five percent of the stuff that must make up the universe is dark. So five percent is stuff like me, you, stars that are normal matter stuff that has you know produced light and and uh, and emits radio electromagnetic waves and stuff like that. Then we have something like maybe 20%, which is what we call dark matter. So here you should know something that uh, we don't say often, but when a physicist calls something dark matter, dark energy, it's a subtle hint that we don't really know what it is. So we said dark matter because we need it. So if you look at the galaxy out there, uh, other galaxies, they, can, they couldn't still be holding together unless they had way more matter in there than what we see. So there must be way more matter that is dark because that's gonna emit light, we cannot see it, to hold the galaxies together. And this is what we call dark matter. Even worse than that, so I told you 5% is normal stuff, 20% is dark matter, 75% is what we call dark energy, which is something that we need to have out there to explain how the universe is expanding. But all that dark means that they do not emit light of any kind. So potentially the only way that we will be able to study these dark components, dark matter and dark energy is through gravitational waves because we need them. We need to have dark matter and dark energy because of their gravitational you know, interaction. But then that's the only thing they do. They interact with gravity and so they, the only way we can study them potentially is with gravitational waves. So that's one of the other exciting things that might come out of this new gravitational wave astronomy, a better understanding of this dark matter and this dark energy, which seems to be a big component of the universe. Somehow I think you're gonna be behind that also. <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> Somebody uh, put another question in the chat oh okay let me i'll read it yeah yeah yes <laughs> I, I i am i am watching a, a, a program tv with my daughter okay this is called uh, uh from disney plus is what is cheese and, and i enjoy it too much because it's, it's so uh, divertido but at the end they they explain the cosmology and they talk about super Charts. I, I don't know if they are using the, the right word, and they talk about parallel universe. The, that technology, the gravity, the gravitational waves, can show us something like that. So, this is um, the idea that there could be more than one universe is actually a real theory, a real idea, which is what is called the multiverse or the multi-universe theory. So. We do not really know if that's true because we are not able to make an experiment to say, you know, if there is another universe, can we detect it, right? Because, you know, this is what physicists and scientists do. You have an idea in your mind and you just don't mean, it's not that you say, ah, I had a beautiful idea, it must be true. No, you said, I have a beautiful idea. How can I prove it or disprove it? How can I build an instrument or do an experiment that will tell me Yes, you're right. No, you're wrong. And so to understand if this theory of multiple universes is true or not, we will need to find some evidence to make some experiment to see if it's true or not. So we don't know how to do that yet, which doesn't mean that it's not true. It doesn't mean that it is true. It's a theory that could, could very well be, be correct, or like many things in science, there must be some part of truth there, but then we have to understand a lot more better, more things. So it's, um, it's surprising that they, they mentioned that in a Disney Plus uh, uh, show, but there is some, some truth there. So this idea that there, might, there could be multiple universe is something that physicists are considering. And who knows, maybe black holes and gravitational waves are a way to discover that or to probe that. That's amazing. Good, good question, Jorge. Any more questions before we go? Well, 
let me stop the recording now before I